My name is Zach Caceres. I run a website called StartupCities.com, and I'm going to be your moderator this evening. I have with me a really exciting panel of people, all of whom are entrepreneurs and all of whom work in this growing space of startup cities, charter cities, special economic zones, and this sort of industry that's growing up around us. To my left is Massimo Mazzoni, uh, an entrepreneur behind various businesses, but tonight we're going to focus on uh, his new city in Honduras named Ciudad Morazan, which I'll explain more about this evening. Next to him, we have Joseph McKinney, the, the founder and CEO of the Kotawa uh, Digital Economic Zone, a cryptocurrency and a, a sort of crypto asset focused jurisdiction in the Kotawa tribal lands uh, in the Carolinas in the United States. Next to him, we have Sir Spearpoint of Cologne, Panama. Sir was the zone manager of the Cologne Free Zone from 2014 to 2017, where he uh, led an important effort to upgrade it to, a, to the Cologne Puerto Libre, a free port, uh, and has also been involved in the reform and improvement uh, and the use, the more intensive use of special economic zones in Panama in general. So please give a round of applause for our panelists and we'll begin. <laughs> Excellent. So to start, I, I would love to go just kind of down the line here, and uh, if you could share a kind of high-level description of what it is that, that you're building with everyone. Massimo? So Ciudad Morazan is one of the three ZEDE uh, already existing in Honduras. We have been uh, existing for two, hour, uh, for two years. Uh, we have uh, about 100 uh, residents. Uh, we used to have... Uh, 4,000 uh, square meter of occupied space by companies, but uh, now the law is uh, under assault, so we lost uh, uh, the companies, and basically now it's a residential community. I will go more detail later, I guess. Everyone, thanks for having me. Um, like you said, my name is Joseph McKinney, and uh, I'm the CEO of the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. The Catawba Digital Economic Zone is the first full-scale uh, special economic zone in the United States in modern history, and it's enabled by the sovereignty of uh, American Indian nation, the Catawba, in the United States. And like every good business, it has an initial target market, uh, which is Web3, digital assets, and fintech. But the ultimate goal is to disrupt Delaware. And for those of you who are not familiar of Delaware's status in governance, it is the main... Uh, a jurisdiction for company and corporation in the United States, especially, but in the world. And uh, we plan to have a nimble jurisdiction take that place. Zona Libre de Colón uh, was founded in 1948 and uh, was uh, among progressives, leftists, was seen as an example of, on one side of the wall, a lot of wealth, on the other side of the wall, a poor town, Colón, on the Atlantic side of the uh, Republic of Panama. And so the idea of Colón Puerto Libre was uh, something that when I was the free zone manager, I proposed it to the then president of the Republic of Panama. And he said, sure, let's do it. And so we were able to successfully introduce uh, benefits, uh, incentives that extended outside of one of the wall of the main free zone into the city of Colón to try and uh, open up and create some wealth in the city and thereby uh, disarm the criticisms that existed from some who attack special economic zones. So I'm wondering if, if you all could expand also, uh, your, your projects reach a very different, different customer basis. And I'm wondering sort of who is the customer for your project and how, how does it make money? How does that work? In our case, uh, we are in Choloma, which is the third uh, city in Honduras, and it's the city of Maquilas. Maquilas are the labor-intensive uh, manufacturing sector that has to export 90% of the production. So our clients are, uh, from the residential side, uh, are blue-collar workers of Honduras, people that make $400 uh, per month. Um, and the companies are uh, companies that make textiles, uh, automotive harnesses, and things like this. So uh, our customer base is focused solely on corporations, LLCs, etc. Uh, we don't have any individuals of the zone. There might be some aspects of physical infrastructure later, and maybe even for some some mixed use farther down the line. 
but in order to maximize our profit potential and our scalability, we're focusing purely on the digital market and company incorporation and services attached to it. And that's the basic standard model for Delaware, which is essentially you have a registration fee and an annual renewal fee or a franchise fee if you have a corporation, which means that you pay more money for more stock that you have in a corporation. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, draft rules for bank chartering, as well as for other uh, financial services within the zone. And the way that we make money off of that is that we you know, have a transaction fee based on that. Our client base is, are businesses in the city of Colón that are unable to compete with Contrabando de Hormiga that you would find uh, that occurs in the free zone and makes it very difficult for a retail business to exist when they have to pay on one side of the wall full taxes versus the free trade zone benefits of no duties, no taxes. And the, uh, the reason that a lot of people buy there because obviously they see that goods are cheaper inside the free zone versus the city. So the idea of Colón Puerto Libre was to extend the benefits so that that, um, that traffic would be minimized as people adopted the uh, benefits in Colón Puerto Libre to be able to attract a customer base. Each one of your projects uh, depends on a, a relationship, right, with the, the surrounding government. And I'm wondering if, if you all could speak to how it was that you were able to, to secure this relationship. What, what is it that you had to do? What were your negotiations like? What were the, the things that you were able to uh, reach an agreement around that enables you to, to innovate in the way that you are? Well, in my case, I don't really like politicians and I don't talk with them so it's uh, I, I have no role I had no role in the creation of uh, the law the law for a combination of luck sheer luck just happened in uh, in Honduras and uh, it was open to everybody I mean you just had to buy a piece of land and to tell uh, some entity in the government that you wanted to become uh, at uh, this is what I did. Uh, many people ask me how I managed to do it. I didn't manage because, I, first of all, I'm not good, and secondly, I would never uh, negotiate uh, to, to, to get uh, well, to create a legislation with, with the government. So I'm not a good uh, person to ask. Uh, this point is actually something I'm the most proud of. Um, so thank you for asking. And uh, I want to thank uh, my wife, Natalie, for helping a lot on that. Um, she does a tremendous a lot more than and then community engagement as a vice president of operations but um, her work in her phd thesis about the best practices in community engagement and, and working with indigenous communities in the space is critically key so the first thing first we demonstrated skin in the game we moved down there we moved down there and met the people and we started talking to leaders not just elected officials but heads of families you know the beautiful thing about the Catawba is there's only three and a half thousand, you know, and, and most of them don't live in the Carolinas, you know, they're, they're scattered everywhere. So you have a good chance of meeting with a lot of people. And it wasn't just we went to, but to politicians. In parallel, we started meeting with those people and we met them where they were. You know, we took them out to dinner and we to Golden Corral for lunch, breakfast and dinner multiple times a week. Yeah, I, I cannot eat fried chicken for breakfast anymore as a consequence. Um, um, but it, it was wonderful. And then going to, uh, uh, you know, family events are important and breaking bread is so key. And um, they're my boss. They, they own 51% of this organization. They have control over the board and they make that very clear. And the more I speak to them about the project, the more they see it. And they are the boss because they're the ones who did it. I think our project, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our project is the only example of a truly grassroots movement for a special economic zone because of developing those relationships. Those leaders uh, went directly to their leadership to secure a special session to vote on this. And the cool thing about the Catawba is they voted through direct democracy. Their legislator is all voting age Catawba citizens. So not only did they secure that special session, it was voted overwhelmingly into law. Um, so um, that's something that I'm very happy about. Basically it's, be yourself, be honest, be upfront about what you have to gain out of it. Make sure that they have the, the benefit and uh, break bread. Sorry, I went a little long. The question is, is interesting in the sense that uh, we have five-year terms in, in Panama between one administration and the other. And the problem is that 
this project, Colo Puerto Libre, was approved by the prior uh, government, and the new government uh, adopted a, a not invented here syndrome, and so that what you find is, is that there's a lot of zigging and zagging because of personalities and just jealousy of the fact that a project was not uh, instituted by uh, the government in power now. So part of the challenges are to maintain the conversations going with the uh, diputados in the area of Colón so that they can be aware uh, of the benefits and just keep the momentum going. Uh, there's a, a liaison office that is designed to help the businesses uh, kind of a, a quick window to get started up. And so that's what we struggle with, is trying to make sure that there are clear channels of communication and this should be apolitical. So if the changes are so good that you're bringing to these zones, why doesn't the whole country just do it? Well, it's, uh, I would say, what Kaplan called, uh, how do you call it, rational irrationality. Uh, for most of the country, uh, it's, it's a thing very far, they are not involved. Uh, the, the value of signaling uh, that they belong to the tribes and they are for nationalism and patriotism and all the collectivist uh, slogans uh, has more value than... Uh, the potential for them to go one day to live there. So it's uh, it's in, in, in public choice is called uh, uh, rational irrationality. It's just stupid. I mean, literally in, in this room, I could probably just say public choice theory and just walk away because that's essentially it. I mean, that's, that's the key element of why special economic zones are probably the only way forward. These types of special jurisdictions are the only way forward everything's been captured. It's not because people are evil or corrupt or inherently bad. It's just the structure of it. It's too damn big and it's too old. And as a consequence, you have these old laws that keep going forward and these stakeholders that are integrated into it. As a consequence, you can't make decisions fast and nor should you. There's a couple of jurisdictions that did make policy decisions fast. One of them is Mao's China. Didn't do too hot. But what they did is when they realized that they had no way forward, is that they needed to create experiments, new ways that they could try different policies and not starve to death. And as a consequence, they turned to special economic zones. It's all structural. And that's why within our zone, we have a nimble regulatory body based on the enabling framework and commercial code that's able to move quickly. Congress is not. They have too many special interests. It's too large. It's too big of a country. Even states, Wyoming meets twice a year. So ultimately, it's all public choice. There's a saying in, in Spanish, la vaca se come poco a poco. And the, the, the fact is, is that in uh, Panama, Zona Libre de Colón was the first one, but we have 15 different Zona Francas. We have Agencia Panama Pacifico, which was created by a special law, a, a new special economic zone that we created last year. So that there are a lot of uh, little islands of success that are being created. There's a law where basically if you've got two hectares, you can set up a Zona Franca. So it's a very uh, easy system, not as well developed as um, say Honduras, where you're trying to do mixed use with uh, residential as well. But I think the, uh, the idea is well established. And the fact is, is that Panama uh, from a tax perspective is views income as territorial. If you make money buying something in China and selling it to Guatemala, it's tax-free because it's offshore. It wasn't sales generated in Panama. So that also helps to uh, sensitize people to the opportunities of free zones where you physically have to bring the goods into Panama and then re-export them, but they're outside of the tax regime in Panama. So, uh, Massimo, I'm, I'm aware that it, it seems like you, you pursued a very specific strategy to understand the customer that was going to come to, uh, to your project. I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the, the research that you did in Chaloma and the kind of strategy that you followed there to develop the project around that particular customer. Not really, Zach. I mean, it's... Uh pretty easy to understand uh, the client. In Honduras, uh, it's, it's one of the most uh, dangerous places on earth. And 
as you know, the Triangulo Norte, Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras are the three countries uh, with the highest uh, homicide rate in the world, the murder rate in the world. And Choloma is the most uh, dangerous uh, place in Honduras, with uh, more than 100 uh, murders every 100,000 people per year. Uh, so it was pretty obvious what the people uh, needed. They needed a place uh, first with security, se physical security. In, in, in Choloma, nobody goes out after 7 o'clock. First of all, most of the people in Choloma, most of the families are uh, single mothers because uh, the, the, the husband is uh, immigrated to the U.S. illegally. So they don't go out. Uh, all the business, like pulperia or so, pay extortion. Uh, so first, uh, there, there is security. Second, it's very basic uh, things like uh, to have a sewage uh, covered because there is open sewage everything or uh, paved roads. Most of the roads are not paved there. Uh, so the, 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 the selling proposition is simple, is to uh, shelter them from the, cur the continuous fear that people in Choloma have, us, every moment of the day, fear of being... Uh, assaulted, raped, mugged, uh, paying extortion, uh, to have the kids uh, uh, to be recruited uh, in Amara. So it was very easy what you have to do. A clean space, uh, decent houses do not have to be expensive houses. They cannot be expensive houses because we rent a $120 per month. So there is no way we can... Uh, uh, spend a three hundred thousand dollar and then rent at one hundred twenty dollars, and roads uh, that don't have uh, holes inside, uh, energy twenty four hour a day, water twenty four hour a day, and uh, people are just flocking in because it's better than uh, the alternative. It's very easy. They, they need, we didn't need uh, any sophisticated uh, market research. If you live in Honduras, and I think in most of Guatemala, it's pretty obvious what we have to offer. Sir, you've said uh, a, f a phrase like this to me, that it turns out that approval may not be the hardest challenge when you're doing something like this. Well, what do you mean by that? The, the, the change of administration, I came, I came to two Antigua forums with the idea and did rapid prototyping to get it approved. And like I told you, I've, I felt like the dog that caught the tire of the car that was driving by. And it was like, wow, we did it, and we implemented it. But now to keep the momentum going, the challenge, like I said earlier, is to keep successive administrations engaged in the original vision that we had and pitched to that administration and convince them that this is something that should be ongoing. So uh, fortunately, uh, the easiest part was, was getting it approved, and now the hard part is maintaining that momentum. Joe, uh, can you talk a little bit more about, can, can, you, can, can you tell us like, what, what is Web3 and why is it that you're targeting Web3 in, in this jurisdiction? Yeah, Web3, um, the term was developed because of uh, people bifurcate different um, eras of the web. You have Web1, which is like AOL, what have you, and then you have sort of like the Facebook, Twitter, Uber era. Um, and what they see in blockchain technologies is, is the next uh, era for the web. And for those that aren't familiar, blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology is essentially having a, a, uh, a ledger that is uh, uh, visible to all that people can see that doesn't require a centralized authority to maintain. And uh, this has been seen in a whole marketplace of different things, ranging from tokens, the thing that we're most familiar with is Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum and, and what have you, but there's many others. Um, there's also what they call non-fungible tokens, and I'm sure uh, many people who study economics here can infer what that is from there. Essentially, it is isn't interchangeable. It has a unique identity associated to it. A lot of people, um, you know, trade it, digital art with, with NFTs, um, uh, but there's a lot more useful use cases, I would argue, maybe in real estate and, and what have you. Um, so it's a whole industry that's nascent, and the reason why it's so important is, for one, it, it does have a lot of advantages by cutting out middlemen and and increasing efficiencies and providing inclusive uh, financial services for all, which is kind of the underpinning for the whole economy. If you're able to deal with the fundamental problems of governance and finance, then you can start to get to the hard problems, the world of atoms. Um, and the reason we're addressing it first is because it's not because of overregulation. 
it's a lack of regulation and clarification about how Web3 is treated under existing law. Because it's such a weird thing that people don't know how to treat it. They don't know how to treat it. Um, look, is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is it something else? So it's, it's kind of low hanging fruit for a regulator. If you have a regulator that understands what it exactly is and how it should fit under a legal framework, then you can open up an enormous potential of a technology that's already opening uh, enormous potential and has so much opportunity. So uh, yeah, it has a lot of uh, growth. Massimo, one of, one of the um, areas that it seems like you're innovating in, in Ciudad Morazan is in the building materials that you're using. Can you speak a bit to, to what you're doing there? Yeah, well, we found a supplier uh, of, um, and it's not a new type of uh, construction material. It actually has uh, 20 years. And uh, it's a polyesterine uh, uh, panel with uh, a mesh of uh, iron uh, inside that you, you it's basically prefab and then uh, you put uh, a layer of uh, uh, two two centimeters of concrete uh, on the two sides it's it's a marginal uh, improvement it's not something that changes our cost it's about 300 dollars per square meter where traditional building in central america for a similar house can be 350 uh, dollar per square meter so yes, it's uh, marginally better. It's much better in terms of uh, time of construction and uh, uh, the, 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 clean, the cleanness uh, of the construction site because uh, the pieces arrived, uh, there are not, uh, as usual in construction in Central America, mountains of cement and construction material everywhere and thousands of people around that you don't understand, exactly understand what they are doing. So it's better, but it's not something that, uh, it, 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 is something that changed. The innovation is not on the physical side, it's, it's in, in the institutional side. By the way, this is possible, uh, or it's, it's easier to do it uh, in our uh, um, project because we only rent. Uh, so it's very difficult to sell a house when you sell that uh, the, the walls are uh, polyesterine. I mean, people usually don't buy it, but it's particularly apt for us because uh, we rent, so people can. Uh, get in uh, and even if they are but i mean they're not uh, going uh, to pay uh, the, the, their their uh, earnings of the next 20 years uh, for, for a plastic house uh, so they can try without uh, taking a risk it's a perfect uh, technology for b2b project like our case but i mean the innovation of uh, the, the Zede and Ciudad Morasan uh, is completely institutional. The construction part is uh, really a marginal uh, issue. Okay, can we dig a little bit on the point that you just brought up uh, that everyone rents? People have pretty strong opinions about renting and owning a home and buying a home and, and all of this. And I'm wondering, you say that that's a big benefit. Certainly in the American context, a lot of people would say, no, everyone dreams of owning a home. So well, why, why is it a benefit? Well, renting is, uh, I mean, I, I would ask why buying uh, is uh, it, it's it's good. There, there are no reasons buying is good because increase the switching cost uh, as a higher risk. Uh, you're involved in things that are not your job, like fixing uh, electrical things. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. The, uh, the reason there are many reasons why it has become uh, the dream uh, that are, uh, in my opinion, uh, they come because of the state. First of all, uh, given uh, the existence of fiat money and continuous inflation, uh, real estate in an environment in which population grow, it's usually a good uh, defense from uh, inflash, inflation. Uh, secondly, renting uh, has, has some uh, problems that are created uh, uh, by the state uh, compared to, to, to buying. For example, at least in Honduras, when you rent, uh, uh, the, the, the people that uh, is the owner has to pay 10% of uh, value added, which is completely lost compared uh, 
to buying. Uh, then there are uh, uh, subsidies everywhere in the world uh, for, for uh, first houses. Uh, I think even in the US, if you buy the first, I don't know, in the US, but usually there are uh, loans uh, that are uh, subsidized. Uh, then there are judicial, I mean, the judiciary does, don't work. In Italy, if you rent uh, to a senior person or to a single mother or one of the one, 100 the type of uh, protected category, it's impossible to kick uh, them out when they don't comply with the covenants of, of the contract. So uh, in, in, a, in a normal world, that is, that's my opinion, that is not uh, distorted by the states, uh, nobody would, or very little people would think about uh, uh, buying a house, but uh, given of the distortion of the states, uh, uh, it makes sense. I should say, you, you all should feel free to chime in as, as you wish on, uh, on these. So, is there a down payment, Massimo? Or it's no, 100, you said rent. it's 120? And we only rent. Uh, so, sorry, the residential, uh, now we have only houses of 60 square meter, two rooms, uh, more the main room and the kitchen. It costs $120 per month, so you pay 240 the first month in advance and a deposit of $120 and you enter. I think when people you know, hear the term Freeport, they think mostly of sort of ships and warehouses and you know, this kind of stuff that Panama's famous for, really. And I'm wondering, what was your vision and uh, you know, what happened about uh, around expanding these zones to something to be more than ships and, and warehouses alone? The, the original genesis of the Colon Free Zone was exactly that. Back in 1948, the members of the Colon Chamber of Commerce we're watching these boats going back and forth, and they said, eh, we need to create an opportunity. And so very pioneering group of people that established Zona Libre de Colón way back then, eh, but precisely taking advantage of the geography to be able to get goods off of the boat, do something with it, and put, put it back on a boat or on a truck or an airplane on the way to final destination. So. The vision that I'm currently working on is expanding the benefits, not to somewhere outside of a port. We have five ports that together represent about 7 million TEUs or 20 foot equivalent units, which is the largest movement transshipment of containers in all of Latin America. Not even Mexico or Brazil move more containers than we do in this small country of 4 million individuals. And so the idea is, what can we do with the contents inside of a port? Because part of the challenges that we found is, for instance, China and Costa Rica sign a free trade agreement, but if the goods go through the free zone to then be re-exported into Costa Rica, Costa Rica doesn't want to recognize the fact that, regardless of the fact that there was a, an intermediate stop, the goods or the value hasn't changed and therefore the free trade agreement should apply. So that's been part of the challenges for the free zone. And so what we did with this port project is to say, okay, it's not a free zone. Let's not call it a free zone because sometimes there's a toxic relationship with free zones and how it's viewed by governments. And so with uh, Deposito Aduanero Logistico, uh, the concept is within the port, the goods can be, you can do the same thing that you're doing in, in the free zone, but it's within the zona primaria of the port and then it's re-exported. And we think that maybe that's the additional step that's required so that, for instance, Chile and Costa Rica can uh, accept the goods with an intermediate stop in a point because it's very difficult to ship goods directly from uh, China to Chile. They have to make a stop somewhere. And so our argument is, is that that stop with the value add it can maintain the origin and therefore the free trade agreements between China and the countries here in the Western Hemisphere. So, Joseph, in, in the United States, there's, there's, a, there's a perception, I think, of, of tribal lands in the U.S., right? The, the association is essentially either it's where there's a casino and you go there and, you, you know, you gamble, or it's a place really... Oftentimes, it is associated with pretty low levels of economic development. 
And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that perception and also maybe what's unique about the, the, the Catawba situation. Yeah, I mean, there's those observations are very accurate. Um, a lot of that poverty, and I would say most of it, if not all of it, is due to very real historical facts that in many cases are ongoing. But a huge percentage of that is also the governance uh, within tribal jurisdictions. And the problem is it takes capital and expertise to run a jurisdiction. And there are plenty of competent uh, uh, people in Indian law and Indian government across the United States. But the type of scale that's necessary for an effective modern government is, is really high. Uh, as a consequence, they don't have full commercial codes. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to set up businesses on the reservation. And outside businesses are incredibly uncomfortable with it. And also as a consequence of that, um, instead of being a jurisdiction, they use their jurisdictional arbitrage and their sovereignty to be the business owners themselves. And you know some of the best opportunities for that are things like gaming or payday lending or cannabis and what have you. And those, all, those strategies all make sense. But what special economic zones allow is allow to attract the necessary capital and expertise to be a full scale jurisdiction. And that's why this is unique and it provides that space for the very first time. So I think with all of these projects, one, one problem many people uh, bring up is that there's a cold start problem here, right? You know, you, you might, even if you have good rules in a particular area, who are the first people that you get there just to get the ball rolling, get the, get the flywheel going, right? Um, what, do you all, what, what, what do you all think about how do you overcome this cold start problem in your, your respective worlds? In our case, this is more an industrial problem uh, than for the client that are uh, industries uh, than, than residents, because we are in, in the middle of uh, uh, Choloma. So for, for a resident, an individual person, we are just like another uh, place. Uh, so it's easy to, if it's just a question of having the price uh, on the, at the market level and to provide a better service. There is a problem of first first moving. In our case, there is no first moving advantage. I mean, somebody, uh, given that it's a new thing, so the, 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 the business uh, don't have any reason to, 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 to be the first to come to the zone. They can stay uh, on a side and uh, looking for other people uh, to enter, taking the risk, and then if it works, uh, they can get in. So the way you do, it's like in business, uh, in any type of business, using pricing. So the first guy that enters, you can give them uh, the first two years half the price uh, or uh, some enticement uh, that... Uh, uh, you can use, you can convince them, and then use them as an example to bring the other guys in. This applies also at the. It, it, it was a problem for, of the Zede. Apply also at the Zede level. There are only three Zedes in Honduras, because there were many com people that I know, uh, entrepreneur in uh, entrepreneur. One those families that dominate uh, the, the the industry in uh, in uh, Central America that could be inter they were interested in opening Zedes but they did not uh, want to be the first because uh, it, 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 there is absolutely no first moving advantage in doing that. So uh, actually, the first two Zede, which is Prospera in uh, Ruatan and us uh, in in, uh, in uh, Choloma. Add a, a ideological component. We are both uh, libertarian, and it, it's a great opportunity for the libertarian movement. Uh, so we took the risk uh, uh, that other uh, groups that were all, only interested in doing that for uh, for money, which is a great reason, but uh, uh, just didn't want to be the first. Um, well, first, I'm just going to be very blunt that for the cold start problem. This is really hard like the hardest thing you can think of doing. And I mean, I, I don't have experience of all jobs and what have you, but they say that entrepreneurship just by itself is chewing glass and looking to an abyss. Add on top of that, the layers of complexity of stakeholders in helping a nation start up a new jurisdiction, it's, it can sometimes get very dark. That's why I have so much respect for the, the gentleman on either side of me for, for doing precisely that and some people that are in our audience. Um, it's very difficult and that we've gotten to this point and 
gentlemen have gotten this point, they should all be applauded. Because um, it's really... <laughs> um, well, no, no, you can save now. <laughs> save it for the end. Save it for the end. <laughs> but um, I do think that we do have a couple advantages. Specifically, y'all are doing something a lot harder, I think. You're in a physical space. That means cost. And as a business, whenever you're acquiring a new customer, you have a marginal cost of getting a new customer, meaning you have to build in the physical environment. And thankfully for us, we're initially starting very much like a software company. That's why VCs love software platforms because if to get a new customer, it's fairly easy. You market it and then you, whatever it costs to run the, the technology, which isn't cheap, but it's certainly per customer, it isn't as, a, as expensive. So the cold start problem from that perspective is good. Also, we're in the United States. So we get to essentially stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of capital security, payment rails, and rule of law. Now, that's not to say that I'm, that I'm blind to the problems and the relative decline to the United States, but momentum is on its side when it comes to those types of things. Um, I would say also, but I, I don't want to be arrogant here. We also have a problem like any other, which is people aren't used to the idea of a tribal government governing uh, Native Americans, I mean, non-Native Americans. It happens, but in business generally, no. Um, but I think a helpful analogy here is, do you remember how weird it was to jump in an Uber? They're strangers, you know? A, ta a, a, a taxi has a medallion, they're government regulated, you know? But back in the day, you use an app and you have a stranger or you use a stranger's house. A couple of years ago, that was insane. What has to happen with all these different things is a layer of education and just grinding. You know, keep being, um, you know, in the forefront of people's minds, people saying, yep, that's an option. And at a certain point, you get a hockey stick, you get adoption. So that's what we're going to have to do. And um, we're going to have to get the adoption. And in terms of company and corporations, the places that you go for that are registered agents and venture capitalists and financiers. Those are the pockets of companies. People set up Delaware entities because they know that VCs like Delaware entities or publicly traded companies like those. So if we're able to capture the interest of a couple of financiers in that space, that's when we can start the move forward. In our case, the, uh, the cold start wasn't such a problem because Suena Libre de Colón was always, already a known entity for many decades. And it was uh, a, a big attraction for a lot of people that wanted to come to Colón because they uh, imagined that there, it, the possibility for doing very cheap purchases compared to buying in the uh, domestic market were, were very large. So that was the, the attraction and a very um, compliant, government because Colón eh, in of the nine provinces of the country it's kind of like Choloma it's a uh, one of the poorest provinces in the whole country and so this particular president because his mother was a teacher in Colón back in the day had a very uh, a special interest in doing investment in Colón so I think that was a, a huge opportunity for us to be able to to get it at least on his desk to consider it and approve it and the uh, idea was already a known entity because of the fact that uh, Zona Libre Colón already existed in Colón Puerto Libre was just an attempt at, at moving outside of the walls. One of the tensions around projects like these, right, is that um, to some extent you can't plan over, you know, certainly an infinite time horizon or maybe even a, a very long time horizon, but you also can't do zero planning because you have this expensive stuff that you need to build and, you know, buildings, it's, it's a serious commitment, right, to put up buildings. How do you handle things like this? The, the how you structure the amount of planning that you do over time as far as the, the physical space and the infrastructure that powers these things? The, the advantage I had was being able to come to Antigua Forum with a crazy, uh, big, hairy-ass idea, as it's referred to technically. And the, uh, the fact that uh, at the Antigua Forum, people from all over the world come with your idea and you're sitting at a station and it's like you're a street vendor and it's like, I got this idea and people will come <laughs> to your station. And if they like it, they will uh, uh, help you. And it was really tough love of the process uh, over the days of the two times that I came with the project so that it really helped me to open my eyes because what happens uh, as an entrepreneur, you're, you're in love with your idea and it's very difficult to, to have that step back and attack it. But 
at Antigua Forum. They love attacking it. And so uh, that was, uh, for me, a, a, a really an eye-opener because what they tell you at Antigua Forum is, what are you going to do next Monday? And so that's what you do is you got to immediately hit the ground running with a roadmap of what you need to do and how you need to do it. And so I think that, for me, was uh, uh, instrumental. Well, I can talk about uh, the planning the physical uh, place, the city. And it's very difficult because the city is a typical example of society that Adam, Adam Ferguson said uh, it's product of human action, but uh, not human design. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to plan uh, from uh, uh, the beginning. But on the other end, uh, you have things that you need to have at the beginning. Uh, the sewage uh, system, the perimeter wall, some basic things uh, where the factories, especially the noisy factory, are going to go in the residential side. Uh, the very important thing is not to go to the others, to, to, to the extreme and, and to micro planning every house or everything. So you, you do just a very general plan. Unfortunately, you, you have to invest a lot of money in basic infrastructure because you have to do it before you build the houses and, and, and uh, the, 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 the real estate uh, above ground. Uh, so you do the main roads uh, and you hope to be, to be lucky. Now, to be what we call an intercom, uh, to be the owner uh, and you rent only, give you a great uh, advantage compared uh, to a place where you sell the houses because if you can if you make a mistake uh, you can change it uh, we rent so if uh, for let's make an example where we are building now now it's cheap housing uh, uh, for for blue collar worker but if we are uh, successful will become the central business district uh, of the community so probably this is not even a, a mistake of planning. It's just that the, 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 the city evolves. So the, 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 the best value of this land where we now have cheap housing, uh, it's probably going to be high rise for offices in 10 years, if you're lucky. And if you are in a subdivision, it's very difficult because you have to use them in domain. Now, in an HEO, I guess, uh, in a subdivision through homeowner association rule, I guess you can put uh, some uh, rules uh, to, to repossess uh, uh, the land and uh, to, to redevelop it. But for us, it's very easy because uh, uh, when the lease is done, uh, we do not renew the lease. Uh, doesn't mean that we kick uh, the blue collar worker away. We just build a better house, hopefully, one kilometer away. And we say, look, uh, um, your lease is over, and we need this land. Uh, and but we have houses that are just as good as the one that you have, and we give you a couple of months free if you accept to move. Uh, anyway, you have to accept. It's it's, it's just a way of uh, being nice. And then we tear down uh, the house. Uh, we build a uh, forty floor, hopefully high rise. So um, a city grows uh, and. Uh, change uh, and and to have uh, a single ownership uh, it is one of the greatest advantage uh, of what we call an entrecom uh, is 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 to use uh, the land uh, uh, allocating to its optimal use um, don't have physical infrastructure but in terms of planning have a vision plan as much as you can and have alternatives but don't be a dogmatist and uh, be creative and learn how to shake it off when you get hit in the face one of the other areas uh, that you know one might have to plan is the long-term management and stewardship of these places. You know, uh, uh, a board of directors or a you know a city council in traditional cities with a mayor and other such things. And I'm wondering how it is that you all are approaching how you structure that long-term management so that the quality of the place is maintained and it stays true to its uh, its the original vision. I think the challenge for us is the fact that the component, there's no private component. It's still the government that's running the law that's been passed and the opportunities that exist. So uh, like Massimo, I'm allergic to too much government. And so I would say that that's kind of our Achilles heel is being able to have that entrepreneurial spirit where there's uh, incentives for 
the, the administrative office to have some key performance indicators. How many people did you meet? How many came in? How many did you get going? Those, those kind of uh, ratios, factors, data just doesn't exist in a, in a government entity where basically those positions are being filled by bureaucrats. So, oh, sorry, go. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so thankfully, we are a private entity, or at least uh, uh, partially so. So um, I run the for-profit entity that manages the zone and that finances the regulatory body. And the regulatory body uh, is an arm of the tribe. It is an arm of the nation. Um, but it is selected out of different stakeholders. It's selected out of the business arm of the tribe, some from elected leadership, and one is appointed from uh, the, the for-profit entity itself. So there's a way to keep that in line and and having all those together, you know, that close relationship with the zone authority and the for-profit management company that helps ties it together. But also, you know, having our, you know, even the for-profit uh, management's board, it's majority Catawba, they have total control over there. The zone authority, they're all Catawban, so they have oversight there. Not only that, but we have to report to the general counsel on a regular basis. So there's all levels of accountability down the line while at the same time having that, that profit motive that's associated with it um, that keeps everyone's incentives aligned. In, in our case, it's really managing a community. And, and uh, we are at the beginning, so we are not saying that we are doing that. But I can tell you what we plan to do in the future. Um, so you have to use uh, you have to listen to your client uh, and and to understand what they want to do and uh, sometimes they don't even know what uh, that there is a beautiful book that you know that is called uh, the one of the french guy uh order without planning uh, the, the, the order without design yeah. order without design yeah and um and it, it, looking at the clients at the resident you see how they use the real estate uh, and 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 so if you're the owner as it's our case uh, you look at them you understand how they use the real estate uh, and so you build uh, what uh, they want uh, so I don't know what the future is. Now we have houses of 60 square meter. They might become, uh, I don't know, we see that uh, five blue collar worker, uh, uh, only male, for example, only female. They go there without the family and they start to use the real estate in a different uh, way. And so we might decide to use uh, some type of housing that is different from what... Uh, uh, we are building now and the other thing is uh, to listen uh, for, for the for the community of the people uh, uh, for example what we think is that uh, is to create a, com a committee of uh, our uh, may let's call mayor that's an employee of us uh, that is responsible of the, the community plus uh, uh, the head of the police uh, it's an important person maybe the priest uh, once we have the church uh, maybe the teacher of the school uh, to decide when to renew the lease. So the teacher might see a kid uh, that come with a black eye and uh, so talk with the head of the police uh, to understand if uh, the father uh, hits uh, the, the wife or the family. And so uh, we can understand uh, if these people uh, can provide the value of the community or uh, subtract from the value of the community. Again, this is a, a thing that only an entrecom can do, not a subdivision, because when you sell, uh, you cannot kick the person unless he does something that is very against the rule. But for us to have a person that get ranks and hit the, the wife, uh, uh, well, I think the wife is probably illegal, but not it's very common in in uh, in central america but but we can see that the person that always uh, fight uh, with the for, we had an example for example now we are small so we have a lot of space to park but there was an asshole that decided to park in front of the house uh, of the neighbor just to break the ball of the neighbor mm -hmm. uh, i mean it's stupid uh, and and uh, so we cut, we cut short the i mean we didn't cut short the lease we, we the lease uh, last uh, three three months uh, and uh, when the lease uh, was due we simply did not renew the lease uh, to this guy now uh, now it's easy because we are i mean only 100 person there but uh, w when the community has 15,000 person you need uh, more antennas more uh, sources of information maybe it's the guy that organized the football uh, club uh, of the kids so this is what we are thinking uh, we will use in the future but we don't know yet because we are not uh, at that level yet 
I don't know, I don't know if it was Mark Twain or Winston Churchill. Those are the only two people that have quotes that no, <laughs> no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. And so emergent order is very important and your ability to be flexible because you can plan all that you want to, but the reality, and especially in our countries, in Latin America, it's really hard. So pretty soon we're gonna turn it over to the audience for questions, but I wanted to try something with you all, um, which is that I'm gonna make a statement or an argument to you, and I'm not gonna qualify it or clarify it in any way, so you can interpret it any way you want, and uh, I'd love to get your reactions, okay? Um, Henry George, genius or crackpot? There's, there's a thin line between genius and madness. <laughs> I love him. I don't have anything clever to say like that, but he's great. <laughs> Cities should issue their own currencies. I personally think currencies and cities are different business. Uh, I, I come from the Web3 space and I've seen a lot of, can I just say the word? <laughs> Shit coins? Um, <laughs> um, so, and I, that'd probably be the case. I mean, a bond, a tokenized municipal bond, that might make a lot of sense, but I don't think that's really necessary. Um, there has to be a specific use case for a currency. Um, uh, I actually do like local currencies. Um, you know, um, that can be sometimes helpful, but I would say the vast majority, 90% of the time when you ask, should I tokenize this or should I make this into a currency? The answer is usually no. One thing that I read about recently is that in Argentina, uh, if you're if you're rich, you can exchange uh, on the blue uh, for dollars. But if you're poor, you go as soon as you collect uh, and buy a pallet of bricks. That's a store of value in Argentina in the face of uh, the rampant inflation that's going on there. Is so. How do you define currency? Bricks are currency for these guys because they are a better store of value than paper. Urban planning is a failed profession. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm, I'm not in the space space, but I, I think there, there's a meme out there of, of like the, like the amount of architecture students and urban planners that have gone up and then sort of like the decline of aesthetics in cities over time. Uh, probably correlation versus causation, but who knows? There are too many urban planners uh, and they're focused in the wrong things, uh, but uh, a few urban planners that understand how city grows uh, have an Im incredible importance uh, in uh, improving uh, the quality of life of people. So it's potentially it's not a failed uh, profession, but now there are a lot of failed uh, urban planners because they do wrong things. One of the things that I, I was really uh, intrigued by was celebration in uh, Florida, Walt Disney project, and how uh, the new urbanism and how can we recover what it's like to be in an old European city where you've got uh, retail downstairs and homes upstairs and going there and looking at it, it was, it was pretty cool. But it was almost like Truman, the movie of, is it real or, or is it not? I grew up there and literally people would knock on our doors and ask us if we were actors like the Truman Show. <laughs> <laughs> Do cities and special economic zones should be high security environments full of security cameras? I, I would I would say yes. It's um, and and this is uh, the whole discussion in a recent colloquium uh, about China and big data and how the uh, the state is controlling. But what what I've learned is that, for instance, London has the highest density of cameras in most of the world, and that's something that we don't know. Uh, but I think, in, especially in our countries, what people are looking for is safety. You have to offer safety, you have to give them the peace of mind that a, a, a single mother who's trying to work and doesn't have to worry about uh, what's gonna happen to my kid uh, in, a, in a very uh, dangerous part of town. It's, it's environment specific because uh, especially at the beginning in Honduras, you have to do that because there is no social trust, uh, you have to do that. Um, probably if I do, if we do something like this uh, in the countryside of Sweden with homogeneous population that already already knows them, themselves, you don't need uh, CCTV in every, uh, in every corner. I hope, for example, for uh, 
uh, for, for Ciudad Morasan that with time uh, we will need uh, less. Uh, for example, uh, at the beginning we have to be very strict. Uh, the, the, the lady that buys the ice cream uh, for the kid and then uh, simply threw the, the garbage uh, and litter, this is not acceptable. So we need uh, the, 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 the camera to go back to the lady and to say, look, lady, this is not the way we, we, we behave like this. Don't do it again. If not, I don't uh, renew the lease. So we need this uh, part. In the future, I hope uh, that the culture of, of people in Choloma that lives in Ciudad Morasan will become like the Swedish and they will uh, will uh, control each other. Once I threw a cigarette in Switzerland and I was basically insulted by all the people around, just just the, the cigarette in, in, the, in the floor. So this, this is ideal. It depends on... Now, when you have to use the CCTV, there are interesting ways of... Uh, that we are not using, but we are thinking... Uh, uh, for example, a blockchain. So if the police use a CCTV, the person that is uh, filmed automatically has access uh, uh, to the same video. Uh, things like this uh, can be introduced uh, that allow, a, if you have to use this type of intrusive control, allow a certain uh, level of uh, trust uh, uh, from the part of the population. So th there is a lot that can be developed there. What people really want is a nice single family home with a two car garage in the suburbs. There are 8 billion people in the world, so it's a pretty generic <laughs> statement. I mean, back in the day, I was happy with a single carry on and nothing else. Um, I mean, I suppose there's a lot of people in the United States that that's the case, but um, I think we're seeing, especially post COVID, the desire for nomadic lifestyle. And we see a lot more of that. And I'm not 100% sure that's a positive thing. I know it's going to happen. I see a lot of positives of it. And I certainly have done that before in the past. Um, but I certainly don't think that the trend is towards that. I think it's probably the opposite. One of the things that uh, I've read about, and it's for the, the people who are in the audience, primarily is it's, it's almost unreachable these days because it's expensive. It, you can't get what used to be the, uh, what was referred to as the American dream. So I think it needs to, to evolve into something like uh, urban areas where you can have a transition where you're getting gentrification and you're younger and you're able to uh, deal with a little bit of sketchiness. That, that's what we did in, way back in the day when we first moved to Panama, was we went to Casco Viejo back before it's what it is today. And so we had a condemned house with nine families next door and uh, the senora that had the, the, the pulperia in the front. And so for us, it was pretty cool. I, that's certainly not what my parents would want. And my mother-in-law was like, divorce him now. <laughs> Governance peaked in the Middle Ages with things like the Hanseatic League, Italian city-states, and, and other such small units. Governance peaked. It reached its its best moment. So um, I think we talked about this yesterday. Um, I think sci-fi can actually be very helpful in many ways and predictive. And I think Foundation is a really good piece of literature about the cycles of centralization, decentralization. And this sounds kind of like moral subjectivist, and I certainly am not. But in terms of what governance and politics is, ultimately you have better and worse. And in, the, in a good scenario, you have the governance that meets the needs of the moment. And it doesn't mean that that's transposable across lines. And as certain, I'm not a decentralist dogmatist. I think centralization in certain contexts can be very helpful. And decentralization can be very bad. And obviously, I care about decentralization now. We're in a point of time where we need to move away from the center and move you know, in a more decentralized manner. But there might be a, a point in the future where that's not the case. So I don't think it makes sense for us to be nostalgic over the Middle Ages, but I do think it's important that we look back at them as examples to see what elements fit now, but also what don't. I, I think Casco Viejo was a place that uh, really opened uh, opportunities for people where it was a place where because of the, the opportunities of uh, really devalued infrastructure, developers were able to purchase and fix up and make really beautiful areas that today are considered some of the top places rated by New York Times and other people who it, 
that's a place where you want to go. So is, is it over? No, I think it evolves. And it, the challenge is to try and keep ahead of, listen to your client, like Massimo said. What, what is it that they're looking for? Maybe it's not the two-car garage. Maybe it's something else. But you really have to have that close contact with people. I agree with the statement. Uh, Italian Comuni and some moment uh, of the Habsburg uh, Holy Roman Empire uh, was the best moment of governance in the last uh, 200 years. Uh, the the gov government has been completely atrophied. There is no possibility of innovation. There are vested interests that eat the government uh, from the inside. Uh, just as an example, uh, I use all, often this uh, uh, anecdote, but under Grover Cleveland, uh, the federal uh, government consumed 3.5 percent of the GDP. Now, in Western state, consume between 4, 40 and 60 percent, and uh, they don't produce any any value. It reminds it reminds me the the chapter of uh, Machinery of Liberty of David Friedman when they talk when he talks about the the, the chapter about university that are the same. Uh, he actually produced a, 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 a document that Adam Smith did uh, 200 years ago and basically says that only at the end of the chapter that it was not uh, him that was reading uh, the chapter, but was uh, Adam Smith. And the same is for the government. There, is, there, has, no, there has been no innovation for from Bismarck, which is a bad, very bad innovation, but from Bismarck to now, there has been no innovation, and uh, and every year is every decade is worse uh, with more resources wasted. Uh, it's awful. Yes, when you had the 200 city to choose, uh, live freely without a passport, just showing up, working, and finding your life for yourself and your family was much better than now. So now's our, our chance to turn this over to the audience for, for audience questions. I believe some people here uh, have, some, have a microphone. As an architecture student, I have like the question that, and we are told and we have studied actually that artificial cities don't work and they're like deemed for failure because you cannot plan a lot of like human behavior. So what did you do in order to secure the future of your cities? And like, um, what is space for growth and for like natural human behavior are you living in there? Well, I, I, I wouldn't agree. I mean, uh, Brasilia was overplanned. It's a typical example of uh, huge failure. Hong Kong uh, has been not. So there are good example of uh, cities that grew very well. And in general, the less arrogance uh, from the planner uh, and the owner, uh, the better the results. In our, in our case, uh, Colón uh, suffered from uh, urban blight as a result of laws that were protecting squatters. And so when you can no longer generate revenue because nobody's paying, you don't invest in repairs. And so it's like downtown Havana, the houses start falling in. But there's still a lot of uh, good bones in the structures in, in Colón. And so the idea is, is that I see an arbitrage opportunity where an uh, entrepreneur can, under the Colón Puerto Libre law, take advantage of the benefits so that it takes out some of the risk. And you're only an hour away, and maybe you can offer a product that's significantly cheaper than living in Panama City. This has been extraordinary. Thank you. Um, I, given that. The rate at which nation state failures are, are compounding and the small scale, unfortunately, to date of the projects which um, exist around the world in the thousands, but not often very large geographically. My question is, could there be a way to have the best of, of the models of the entrepreneurial communities initiated on small scale, but then to change the political dynamic from one of suspicion to being one of popular grassroots um, support for making it many fold larger and much faster. And something like the following scenario, there's 
a lot of real estate that is in state ownership, um, forfeited tax payments, whatever, that could be put out to tender in partnership with the residents who are impoverished so that they're, they're not um, frozen out of the uplift that can happen when the policies that you're, you're introducing occur. So the question, I, I guess, is whether you see your projects potentially as springboards to make possible a large scale new kind of partnership, success sharing partnership, where individuals in the community become stakeholders in the next wave of large scale expansion. Not that they're actively man managing, but they're getting shares of the lease revenue that can go up by tenfold or 50 fold in short order if governments deliver the quality of, of the business environments that you're working for. That was one of the things that uh, I was uh, pointed out in the, in the workshops at the Antigua Forum was the interest groups and certainly the suspicion with which the residents look at somebody who's coming and it's like, what's your ulterior motive? What are you gonna do? Are you really coming here to help me? And there's huge skepticism. So the, the, the importance of, and that's what happened in Casco Viejo because that was part of our model was look at how successful Casco Viejo in Panama City was. Maybe that can happen over here uh, with the same human capital. And unfortunately it hasn't had the take up, but again, it's very early on. We're talking maybe five years since the, uh, the law was introduced, the, the Colón Free Trade Zone 1948 to when it really started uh, in the mid 60s, it took a while. So it, the idea is to keep the momentum and, and just uh, the ground game, blocking and tackling one day at a time. So Mark, we, we've had the pleasure of working together, including on, 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 on the book, Founding Startup Societies, and uh, which w comes from all of your wonderful insights. And in, uh, you know, uh, what, what Mark has really theorized is the importance of local communities getting significant benefit from the project in order to align stakeholders and from scaling, precisely because of the cold start problem. It's really hard to start something large uh, you have to start from a small place. And how we talk about it in, in the book is like a, a co-working space, something really small, a single building. Um, how, how we take it a little bit further is we take it into a couple of millimeters, you know, on a server somewhere and scale from there. And how we address the question of aligning stakeholders is we just give them 50% of 51% of it, make them the owner. It makes it a lot simpler um, and uh, yeah, aligns their, their, their benefits. I, I, I don't agree. I mean, we have to eliminate this uh, pass, uh, overpass this idea that governance is a product that is different from, uh, for example, a shampoo. I, when I use the shampoo of Proter Gamble, I don't even think to, that Pro Proter Gamble have to give me what brand share. Of, what brand of shampoo do you use? I have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, governance seems different because uh, it absorbs so much money now. But uh, if it's uh, brought down to the basics, uh, it's probably four or five percent of the GDP. So it's not. Uh, let's not sacralize uh, governance as, as. So if you provide a better service, uh, it will be just another uh, market product. The people will come there without other incentive. That is, uh, it's a better better product than the competition. So. We, I don't think we, you need uh, to do... You can use uh, uh, incentive like giving share, for example, and we thought about that uh, by, by the leaders. Uh, for example, the lady that organized the house for battered uh, ladies uh, or the guy that organized the little kid uh, league uh, because you want to keep them inside uh, the, um, the community because it increased the value of the community. But specific person. It's not that uh, you have to give to everybody. I, I don't believe that. I think it's a form of co collectivism that is not needed. I just want to make a brief comment on that. I think that um, 
I actually do agree with what, what Mark's proposing. And the reason I agree with it is what happens when you set up one of these zones is the surrounding population is very skeptical um, about what it is that you're doing and what your, what your ambitions and purpose is. And if you don't quickly align the incentives as closely as you can with your project, it's very easy for that, uh, for that community that surrounds your project to be co-opted by the enemies of the project. And then you have to exert enormous amounts of energy to actually overcome that opposition. And you end up fighting a battle that you, that you could have um, saved on, if you want, uh, by, by align, aligning those interests uh, earlier. So uh, we haven't figured out how to do that yet, uh, but I think it is something that needs to be uh, carefully thought of for future projects so that you can hit the ground with the community aligned as quickly as possible. In our case, Joe, for example, sometimes speak just speaking with a community just wasn't enough. We spoke to all communities and we still had the opposition. So I think finding a way to align the communities is, is crucial. Hey, that's what you described, especially if you have to pay the community around, is what I in Rand call the sanction of the victim. If I have to do that, I prefer not to do that. It's, it's disgusting, the, just the idea. If it, even if probably from a business point of view it makes sense. One of the things that we've seen is modifications. I was involved in a modification of the law of um, Colom, Zona Libre de Colón also, because what we saw was what was written in 1948 hadn't kept up with the times. And so we expanded the opportunities of what could be done in the free zone. So as long as there's land, I'm, I'm in all in favor of opening up investment. Uh, right now, what we're seeing post COVID is the near shoring phenomenon so that there's opportunities, much like what Joseph was saying about Shenzhen way back in the day, now there's opportunities for maybe opening up a, and seeing that new wave of investment that's coming that's not limited by, it's only limited by the size of the space that you have a, at your disposal. So I think inherently both zones and zone companies are controlled in our limits. You can't have a zone that is sovereign, that would, it would be its own sovereign identity. A zone has to be within a jurisdictional framework where it's controlled by a sovereign. And in terms of the zone and how it relates to companies, um, it's, the game is governance and governance does not mean a free for all. You would have a very bad zone if that was the case. If it was just absolutely anything goes and no one would wanna go there. Um, so you have to have limits. I mean, business people, they aren't, it, I'm sorry to say this, most business people are anarcho-capitalists. They like rules. They like things that have been tried and true. They like what attorneys tell them to do. Um, so they want people to have the rules. And uh, yeah, I mean, rules are basically there for when things go wrong. You know, you don't make a contract for when things go right. You go for when, when there's conflict. So it's the absolute role of the zone to define the bounds of that in a way that reduces the cost of doing business in the most reasonable way possible and allows for innovation. Well, I think for a relatively poor country like the country of, of Central America is not an option. I mean, there are uh, tens of maybe 100 states with free trade uh, zones. And uh, if you want to be in that business, uh, you have uh, to compete with the others. Uh, and all this country needed to be in that business because they have to pass uh, the step of being a sweatshop uh, before doing uh, movies like Hollywood uh, or things like that. So it's, it's, I don't know if it was a question of normative question, we should have uh, or not a free trade zone, but it's not, it's not a question uh, that has any value. You must have free trade zone and free, tra free trade zone must have uh, at the very least, uh, the best uh, fiscal uh, condition, because if not, you're not uh, a realistic option uh, for, for the clients. And the competition now is, is not on fiscal. I mean, uh, now fiscal is a commodity. You don't pay taxes anywhere in any free, tri free, free zone. It's, uh, it's uh, other type of autonomy from red tape uh, and uh, more and more, uh, I hope, from, from uh, having... Uh, the residential component uh, close uh, or even inside. Thank you all very much and let's hear it for our panelists.